Let's start by talking about the syntax you use to create stored procedures. All right, this probably looks kind of daunting, but there are a lot of options that you'll rarely use when you create stored procedures. But it's nice to have the flexibility so that you can create a stored procedure that executes and performs as you want. First thing is that, as with all database objects, stored procedure names have to conform to the rules for identifiers and have to be unique within the database and the schema for each owner. The add parameter argument specifies the parameters for the stored procedure and has to be declared with a data type. You can use up to 2,100 parameters, almost certainly more than you'll ever need. I always used to be a little bit flip about that number, just not being able to imagine that anyone would ever have a need for anywhere close to 2,000 input parameters for a stored procedure, input or output parameters. But it turns out that there are certain applications, and I think there was one live course I was teaching where there was a number of people that worked on banking applications where they made a very good case that they actually bumped up against that limit with some reg regularity. So there's some very complex financial things that are required. So, okay, most stored procedures are probably only going to have a handful of, of parameters, but at least you do have a fair number before you hit the limit. Okay, so I'll talk about input and output parameters a little bit later. One option you can, you can use is with recompile. With this option, SQL Server will not cache a plan and instead recompiles the procedure every time SQL Server invokes it. This is an option that you should rarely use, unless you absolutely need it for a very good reason. And then the encryption option will encrypt the definition of the stored procedure in order to deter users from casually examining the code. So you'll see some examples of creating stored procedures, but know that there's a lot of additional options. And this is one of the longer topics in, in books online because there are so many different things you can do when you create stored procedures. All right, so let's talk about creating stored procedures using Management Studio. And there's several different ways that you can use to do this. You can write T-SQL within a query editor. So you have to know the syntax, you have the benefit of IntelliSense, but you can write the straight code. You can create a new stored procedure using stored procedures using that node within Object Explorer. And then finally, you can also use the Template Explorer. And there's a few other ways, but these are the primary ways that you can create them using Management Studio. You can certainly also create them in a text editor and then load them into Management Studio or some of the code, execute from the command line. There's, there's various other ways to do it. But these are the three main ways that you'll use most often. So here I am in Management Studio. So as you can see, I have some sample code that I'm going to be showing you. But this is all within a query editor window. And you can create a new query by just clicking the New Query button, and then type in your Transact SQL code. So that's one way. If you're really into writing the code, that's a good way to do it, and certainly a way that you should emphasize early on as you're learning Transact SQL and SQL Server because there's nothing like writing raw Transact SQL and running it and recovering from the errors and so forth. Okay, another way to create a stored procedure is I can come over here to Object Explorer. I'll come down here into the Northwind database and into the programmability node here within a specific database. As you can see, there's different kinds of objects and specifically stored procedures. And as you can see, Northwind database comes with a number of built-in stored procedures. But what's really nice is I can right-click here and select New Stored Procedure, and that opens up this template, heavily commented template, that you can use to create a stored procedure. And you can use the option here of specifying values for the template parameters or directly change the code by changing all of these values that are delimited by angle brackets. You can also use the template browser. If it wasn't open, I could open it using the View menu and selecting the Template Explorer. But the template browser has a section down here for stored procedures, and it allows you to create stored procedures of different kinds.
And if you double click on a template, it'll open up a similar template here within a query editor window. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of different ways for creating stored procedures with different levels of help for you. So my focus in this course, though, is on creating stored procedures using Transact SQL. But as long as you thoroughly understand the syntax of the create procedure statement, if not all of the more esoteric options, then you'll be much more effective at using these other tools within Management Studio. Okay, so let me clean up the workspace here a little bit. And we can start looking at using code to create stored procedures. And I'll change over to Northwind. Okay. Now, one of the most important reasons to use stored procedures is their support for both input and output parameters, which is one way of letting you create structured code. What I'm going to do now is talk about creating stored procedures and handling parameters. So I'm going to start by creating a very simple stored procedure. So it's called list employees. This procedure selects columns from the employees table in the Northwind database. So it's a very simple kind of example. So I'll talk about set no count in just a moment. But what the stored procedure does is it essentially wraps this select statement. Now, it won't be very often that you create a simple stored procedure like this, just wrapping a, a select statement. More often, you're going to have complex code, but really, most of the time, you're going to have much more complex select statements, the kind of code that you want to write once, save as, as an object in the database, and then just be able to execute later without having to rewrite it and figure everything out over and over again. OK, so what I'm going to do is select this code, including the Go statement. That's just a separator within uh, Management Studio. And one of the things is I can check the syntax. I click the button there. As long as the command completes successfully, then it means that the syntax is valid. Now I had a good idea that that was going to be the case because I don't have any red squigglies from IntelliSense as long as IntelliSense is turned on. But this is a way to explicitly check the highlighted code. And just like executing code, if I don't have anything selected, this button will check all of the syntax for this entire file. OK, so I'm going to execute this code now which creates the stored procedure, but doesn't execute it. So at this point, SQL Server has checked my syntax, but defers the resolution of the names of objects until the first time the procedure runs. So again, you can create procedures for tables that don't yet, yet exist, but will eventually exist before the procedure, before you ex execute this code the first time. But it also means that if within the stored procedure you spell a name incorrectly, then you won't find out about it until you try to run the procedure. But IntelliSense, if you have it turned on, will give you some feedback about that. Okay, so in this case, the stored procedure is returning a result set. And that's the easiest way to return something from a stored procedure using a select statement. You, and you can have multiple select statements within a, a single stored procedure to return multiple result sets. But keep in mind that using the stored procedure is different from using a view containing the same select statement. You can't select just certain rows or columns from the result set of a stored procedure as you can with a view. In addition, you can't insert, update, or delete rows from the result set of a stored procedure as you can with updatable views. So instead, you have to write code that takes care of performing those kinds of actions within the body of the stored procedure. OK, and then as far as the syntax goes, you don't have to spell out procedure entirely. Just using PROC, P-R-O-C, would be a valid abbreviation there. Save a few keystrokes. And that's the case with various kinds of Transact SQL statements, particularly the ones that create or alter different database objects. OK, so let's talk about this set no count on statement right here. Now, as a general rule, you should use this statement as the first statement after the as clause, or after the as keyword, in your stored procedures. 
This eliminates the message about number of rows affected in the messages pane. It also eliminates what's called the done in proc message that SQL Server communicates to the client application. Some client APIs consume that extra return value as additional information that it then provides to the calling application. But in other APIs, depending on what client API you're using, it can result in issues that are difficult to debug when that message is the first re result set returned from calling in the stored procedure. So whether you use it or not depends upon the API that you're using to access the stored procedure, to execute the stored procedure. But for the most part, you'll generally want to turn the information off. The nice thing is that even if you set no count on, but you still need information about the number of rows that were affected by the code within the stored procedure, you can use the at at row count global function in order to return that same information. So setting no count on doesn't affect getting access to the number of rows affected. And often you'll see stored procedure code that provides the at at row count value as an output parameter or return value of a stored procedure. Okay, so I don't remember if I already created that. So yes, I already did. So it exists within the, the Northwind database. And then to execute a stored procedure, you can use the execute keyword. And that executes the code, tests it, runs it, and you can see what result set you get back. And so as a result, you see the list of employees within the Northwind database. Shorter version of that is exec. That's perfectly valid as well. That performs the exact same operation. If the stored procedure is called in the first statement in a batch, you can even omit exec. And that, in fact, is why I have the go statement there, so that this is in a separate batch. And it's really just a convenience so that IntelliSense isn't giving me a red squiggly telling me that it has to be the first statement in a batch or various things like that. So you'll see that most of the code that I write for this course has a lot of goes in there just to keep the batches separate. But it also shows you the code that, that I generally intend be executed as a batch of statements. And so in fact, what I can do is do that alone because when I highlight something, Management Studio considers that to be an individual batch. And I once again get the results of executing that stored procedure. And by the way, if I try to execute the stored procedure, but it doesn't yet exist, or if the context isn't set to the Northwind database here, then you'll get an error that says, could not find stored procedure and gives you the stored procedure name. So you just have to go back in and create the procedure, and then you can execute it. OK, simple stored procedure doesn't take any parameters. Control R to close the result window there. OK, so let's talk about working with parameters. You can pass input parameter values to a stored procedure when you execute it, as long as you've declared them and set their data type in the stored procedure definition. So that's what I do right here. If you have multiple parameters, then you separate the values with commas. And like all transact SQL variables, parameter names have to begin with the at sign. That's what identifies that object as a variable. So this stored procedure, called list employees by city, takes a single input parameter called city, and it's a var char 25. In this case, virtually always, if this is going to be compared to a particular column within the table that you're accessing, then you want it to be the same data type as that underlying column. That's not abs always absolutely required, but you can get into some data conversion issues if you don't with certain data types and, and so forth. So a good practice is to use the same data type as the column if this is data that you're going to compare to a column within a, a table. OK, so that's the parameter right there. And in this case, it's being used by comparing the value of that city parameter to the value of the city column in order to filter the result sets. So this is the same sort of operation as if I 
included a static string to compare to city within that WHERE clause. And most of the time, within a stored procedure, you're going to want to include a WHERE clause on any result sets to limit the number of rows that are returned to client applications. OK, so I'll execute this code, which creates the stored procedure. And then there's a couple different ways in order to execute stored procedures with parameters. Again, these apply to code that I'm going to execute here within the query editor. There are different ways of supplying parameter values from client applications, but that depends on the API that you're using in order to access SQL Server. OK, so I can explicitly specify the parameter name, and here setting at city equal to London. And there you can see all of our London customers. Or I can supply the parameters in the order in which they're defined. In this case, there's only a single parameter, so I just include that string that I want to use. And I get the same results. And alternatively, I could declare in this code here, I could declare a variable that I then set to the value of, say, the London string or whatever city that I want to do, and then pass the variable, and then it'll use the parameter value there as well. Just keep in mind that if you use this syntax, you have to pass the values in the same order in which multiple parameters are defined within the stored procedure. OK, one of the things you can do as well is to supply a default value with any parameters that you define. This makes the parameter optional. So if you call the stored procedure without specifying the parameter value, then the stored procedure will use the default value instead of raising an error. So here's how you supply the default value. So this is similar code to the previous stored procedure. But at city now is optional. And if it's not supplied, then city will be set to null. Now this may seem a little bit redundant, because if I declare a variable in SQL Server and don't supply a value initially, then it's set to null. But in this case, if I don't supply a parameter for the city parameter, or value for the city parameter, the stored procedure will use null, but in the previous stored procedure, it'll complain that it's not getting a value for city. So in that case, in the previous procedure, I would have to explicitly pass a null if that's what I wanted to supply. OK, so in this case, it's going to use null for that parameter value if it's not supplied. And now I can use, I can test the value of the parameter and execute different select statements. So if it's null, I'm going to return all employees. Otherwise, I'm going to only return the employees in a specific city if the value of the parameter is not null. So you can start to see that you can now write some more complex logic based on parameter values. So I'll create that stored procedure. And here's an example of executing that stored procedure with an explicit city. So once again, you can see I get the list of employees within London. If I don't supply a parameter, then it executes the select statement that returns all employees no matter what city they're located in. 